Uh, first up, disclaimer, of course, um, I'll be talking a little bit about some future features, so kind of your standard disclaimer, but most of it's here and now. Uh, what people have been deploying uh, for a while, and I'll be talking about all the different components that make up NSX. So to start with, um, this is kind of our standard bookend slide. So if you've been to an NSX session before, you probably have seen this slide um, about our adoption rate. Uh, one thing I wanted to mention for this uh, session itself is about what we're doing next and how that can relate to all the technical aspects of NSX today. So the first up is security. Um, and we're going to continue to expand security. I'll talk a lot about um, our distributed firewalling, how that works within NSX, um, and all the different components there. Um, next up is our deeper integration with um, the physical. So there's a lot of sessions here at uh, VMworld about operations and troubleshooting and managing how we integrate with the rest of the components of the architecture that makes up the software-defined data center. And as we do that, um, we'll talk a little bit about some of the new features in 6.2, uh, the release that was just announced uh, this week, formally announced, but if you saw some blogs last week, you know we posted it a bit early. Um, Moving on, um, application continuity is probably a new term for some people, some people not. Um, I like to think of it as multi-site, um, how to deal with DR or just cross VC in general. So I'll talk about some of the new features and how they work within NSX um, when we think about uh, multiple sites or just multiple vCenters in the same site. Um, 6.2 came out, and we'll talk more about it. Um, assess and assess the objectives here. So we got an hour to do a deep dive. Um, we, our deep dives are normally week long, so <laughs> we're condensing this to really be a good, solid technical introduction to NSX and the components. Um, as I step through the presentation, there'll be little bookmarks kind of up on the top right of the slide where you can go to different sessions to see more information. Like logical routing, for example. I'll step you through logical routing, but we have a full hour dedicated to logical routing or firewalling or, or so on. So I'll kind of t take it through the different components, but at some point it's going to be a handoff to say, okay, well, let's spend another hour and another session on it. So we'll, we'll, we'll try to uh, walk you through that. Um, actually, before I go on, uh, reference architectures. So there's a great two-day session, or a, a two-track session, so two hours of just the architecture itself, the topologies, how we integrate. Um, there's another session on how we integrate with Cisco networking, uh, for example, and there's a full hour just on that itself. So I'm not going to be touching that deep on actual the, the how do you design and do topologies because there's some really great sessions just for that. But we'll go over um, those in a little bit higher level so you know kind of the, the basis of what, you're, what you can expect. So um, if you've seen NSX before, you know it's made up of various different components. So in this presentation, we're going to be walking through each of these components and understand how they work. We're going to start with the, the, um, the write, the management APIs, the controller, um, how it's deployed, how it's operated. Um, but then we'll step through the different components like switching and routing and firewall, load balancing, and the services that NSX provides. So um, this level setting of uh, what NSX, what's kind of the, the nirvana of deploying a architecture with NSX. And hopefully after the session, you'll have a good understanding of how all this works. Um, and works together, and how it's deployed, what tools are being used for it. Um, but we start out with the web, a kind of a classic three-tier application, your web app and database tiers. Um, we connect it with logical switching. Uh, we'll step through how that works, um, connecting those logical switching together, uh, connecting those VMs, how, they, how do they communicate, VXLAN, so the, the transport protocol that makes all of this work together. Um, and then distributed logical routing. So say these web and app and database tiers are on separate subnets. They have their own broadcast domains. How do they communicate with each other? Um, one aspect is distributed logical routing. We actually distribute that routing uh, throughout the entire infrastructure. So each host has its own uh, logical routing components uh, to be able to do that. And that's actually one really great benefit um, of NSX as we can now route within the same host. So say a web, a web VM is on the same uh, host as an as a app VM. 
Uh, we don't have to go to the, the physical network to route anymore. We can do that directly with the distributed logical router. Um, next up is our segmentation. So let's create uh, distributed firewalling policies across each of the groups. So we'll talk about how that's taken care of, um, how, we, how we use the NSX Manager um, and the plugins into vCenter to be able to add security on top of this, to add that segmentation um, uh, across the different components. And then from there, we'll talk about how we get out. So this is great, this is all well and good in the virtual realm, but there's always services that need to either communicate in, get information out, or even uh, servers that are on the same domain as the virtual. So say we have a database um, tier, and the database tier is made up of some virtual, virtualized services and some physical services. So how do we connect that? And we have several different options and methods to be able to do that and uh, have that scale and have that um, extend um, uh, security and other aspects to that world. And load balancing. So this is just an example of a service. We'll talk a little bit about more services, but say we want to add a load balancing to the web tier uh, to be able to do load balancing. There's a session just on load balancing. Um, once we get to the load balancing session, I'll, I'll reference it. Um, we do this centrally today uh, in a centralized way, but we're going to be doing a technology preview in that session of distributed load balancing and how that works. So from there, we can start creating even more advanced security policies past just segment. Um, we can create different security policies for everything, a default security policy, and each individual web policies and how they, how they communicate with each other. So hopefully by the end of this session, you'll have a good understanding of how all of this works together. It's, not, it's no longer magic, it's something that's actually tangible and you have uh, some sense of, of how, it, how it interacts together. So as far as the agenda, uh, we'll first walk through the NSX architecture and components the NSX manager, the controllers, how they're all brought up and what their functions are. And then we'll move switching, routing, distributed firewalling, services, and so on. So architecture and components. Uh, I'm a, a networking guy myself. I've come back from, from uh, been doing networking for a long time. Uh, I like to build the slide from the bottom up. Others like to build it from the top down. Um, but I, I like to build it from the bottom up because we want to start with the foundation of the physical network itself. Um, some of you have, may have heard that with NSX, you don't care about the physical network. Um, that's wrong. We care about the physical network. We want to make sure that it operates correctly. We want to make sure that you're successful with your deployments. We want to make sure the operations and troubleshooting scenarios work across the virtual and the physical. As we do these overlays, how do you troubleshoot that down to, say, a packet loss on a top of rack switch? How does it integrate with the physical and so on? So while we don't care what you use from a physical network standpoint, you can use any set of switches, routers that you want. You can do spine leaf topologies. You can do aggregation, um, the three tier kind of uh, topologies. But in, in the end, we want to make you successful with that, those deployments. Um, moving on up. So just as a physical network has a data plane, not a lot changes from a data plane perspective once we go into the, the realm of software. Uh, the same characteristics of a data plane hold true. We want it to be very high speed, and we want it to scale. So we don't want to punt every packet up to a controller to figure out where the routing is and, and then send it back down and have that um, take place in these bottlenecks and everything is, gets involved with um, kind of this software control mechanism. That's not what we're doing here. Um, We have the data plane that's full of distributed functions, so we can do things in kernel in a distributed fashion. So that means we can have each host scale out. So 20 gigs per second worth of throughput, um, two 10 gig ports in and out, we can do um, near line rate when we're doing all of these functions and with the minimal CPU load. Um, moving, whoops, moving up the stack, <coughs> we have our, back up one, we have our control plane. So our control plane is similar to when you're building a control plane of say, if you're from a networking world, a logical or a, um, a, a modular chassis type 
infrastructure where you have a set of control planes that manages your topologies. It manages how you deal with control plane traffic like ARPs and broadcasts and, and routing protocols um, to be able to push state down to the fast fabric. So that's similar to what our control plane does in NSX. We have a set of controllers that are managing those topologies. I'll talk about what exactly those controllers do, how it's set up in a cluster, um, but it's, it's not meant to every packet's gonna go up through the controller and back out. Um, we set up state, we push that state down into the, uh, the data plane, and the data plane's free to communicate. And NSX Manager is another component. So NSX Manager is really kind of your user interface into NSX. It's what um, installs the, uh, a plugin into vCenter, uh, to, to keep that same single plane of management, but it's really kind of your entry point uh, for configuration and all the, all the APIs if you want to use a cloud management platform. So uh, moving on up the stack, the cloud management platforms all can have APIs directly into um, NSX. So um, vRealize uh, Automation, uh, OpenStack, um, or any custom uh, type of uh, cloud management platform can integrate within um, this infrastructure. So let's dive a little bit deeper into the actual components of the data plane. So first of all, um, we have a couple different components in the data plane. Um, we have the compute clusters themselves, since they operate in the data plane. Uh, we have the different uh, modules that will be installed on that. And then the edge clusters and VTEPs. How do we get to the physical? So we have edge clusters, we have hardware VTEPs now in the top of rack switches to be able to provide that functionality. <coughs> so as we look a little bit further into the ESXi. So as we're configuring this and bringing this up, and I'll walk through kind of a sample of how this actually works in a second. Um, but it's essentially a set of uh, VM kernel modules, your VIBs that are being installed into the hypervisor. And what those VIBs encompass uh, four different things. So you have your logical switching, your logical routing, your distributive firewall, and what I don't list here is a user world agent to make sure that it's kind of the communication bus uh, for all of this and th that makes it work. So we install those directly onto the host um, or onto the hypervisor itself in the kernel. So we're able to do things very fast and in a distributed fashion. And I'll say distributed a lot in this, but um, there's really important reasons why we why it's a distributed system, and I'll talk a bit more about that when we get to each of the sections. Um, NSX Edge Services. So these encompass many different things. Um, the first is how we do routing. How do we get from the physical to virtual, all your P plus V um, within your infrastructure? This is a VM form factor, so it's installed as a VM. I'll talk, a little, and once I get to it, I'll talk about some, how the form factor, the sizing looks like. Um, it's, it, it can scale out, it's not just one VM. You can have um, many different VMs out there. For routing itself, um, outside kind of your north-south traffic, we can do up to eight, so 80 gigs worth of throughput from north to south. Um, East-west is as far as you scale, right? As many, um, each, each host adds its own set of distributed logical routing um, functionality. And it also provides L3 through 7 services. So things like NAT, um, things like L2 VPN, SSL VPN, all of those functionalities um, are also part of the, um, that VM. Next up is the hardware VTEP. So this is something that's new for 6.2, um, the, the, our latest release. And this is something that allows us to incorporate OVSDB protocol into the top of rack switch. So I haven't really talked about OVSDB. It's our protocol to distribute that state. So as I talked about before, we have that control layer that's distributing state, all the topology information directly down into the VMs, or I mean into the hypervisors. Uh, we can do that now into a top of rack switch and some of our partners. Um, and that provides a layer two bridging. So as I, as I mentioned before, when we have a database tier that has both web, I mean a database tier that has both physical and virtual assets in it, uh, we can actually use a top of rack switch to de-encapsulate and kind of send traffic out to the physical from that virtual realm. 
Uh, we can do that today uh, in other fashions, such as the Edge Services Gateway, but it adds yet another tool to the toolkit to be able to do really high performance and scale um, that, that uh, mechanism. So let's take a look a, a bit further at the control pane components. So um, as we move forward into the NSX controllers um, themselves, so again, they're, the, they're a VM form factor. Uh, four vCPUs, uh, four gigs of RAM, um, data plane programming, the control plane isolation I've been talking about quite a bit. Um, benefits of scaling out, um, high availability. So they're in a cluster. So as we build out this NSX cluster, uh, we have a set of, um, it's a high availability <coughs> based off DRS with anti-infinity. Um, but it's really, they're not just um, like kind of an active standby configuration. They're actually um, deployed, and there's five key functions that, this that these uh, controllers actually have, and those functions will decide a master. So say I have this topology um, function where I need to calculate and push down topology information, or a database uh, where I keep track of ARPs or MAC addresses um, within the system. Uh, there'll be a master elected um, out of these three uh, controllers, and again, there's, there's, right now there's three. Um, minimum, maximum value is three. Um, that's an easy one to decide. Uh, uh, so you'll pick a master for a function, but that doesn't mean that controller is only the, the only controller that's doing that function. It'll actually slice up the, um, uh, the, the work, the workload, and distribute that among the other controllers so that you have kind of this um, uh, load sharing amongst all the controllers. Another function is the persistent server to make sure the data is persistent across the, 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 the different controllers so that you're able to uh, handle a loss of a controller and add that high availability uh, into the mix. So I think the core function of the controller um, outside of these, I mean, there's an API provider, there's other things that the controller does, but it's really about keeping track of that state to be able to push down into, into the network so that we have um, a set of uh, this user world agent that is communicating to, and we're able to forward traffic. I think that's kind of just the bare bones of what we got to do. We got to get packets in and packets out. We got to, they have to know the destination of where, they're, where they need to go. So I'll walk through in a second a kind of a packet walk of how that works with the controller, but essentially all you're doing is trying to figure out where um, the traffic needs to go so if I need to ARP for, a pa ARP for another IP address, I can actually, that's intercepted by the controllers itself, or actually intercepted first by the VTEP, but then by the controllers, which I'll discuss. Um, but the point I'm trying to get to is this, um, uh, laser's not really working, uh, uh, the VXLAN with no multicast. So this is one of the core kind of benefits out of the controller that we get. So VXLAN has been around for a while, um, it's been implemented across physical networking devices for a while, but it relied on multicast. And if you're not familiar with networking, uh, multicast is a way to disseminate information um, in kind of like a, a join a group, and then it'll, it'll replicate traffic to those groups, but it, it, it's really complex. Um, that's why VXLAN before the controller didn't really get adopted very well. Because it was complex, you had to uh, deploy a protocol independent multicast or PIM, and you had to create this whole kind of um, uh, multicast domain. And it, it was really complex and didn't take off. So we, adding in the controller, we eliminate that need for multicast and keeping, keeping that state, basically creating the controller and the data plane. So, um, if you're confused there, I'll, there's gonna be a packet walk that I'll walk through that each individual step, so uh, don't worry. <laughs> um, management plane components. So, of course the management plane has the NSX manager that I talked about before. It's kind of the central point for NSX. It handles all the installation of all the rest of the components within it. Um, so this is the first thing you're gonna deploy is this NSX manager. It's gonna have a one-to-one -one mapping with vCenter. We have the ability to do cross vCenter NSX today in 6.2, uh, which I'll we'll talk about in a second. But we're still going to have a one-to-one -one mapping between the NSX manager and the vCenter. So the NSX manager will install the plugin into the vCenter, 
and you still have that single plane of glass management tool that manages everything, um, even though you have the NSX manager on the side. We have our uh, cloud management platforms, VRA, OpenStack, et cetera, uh, that I mentioned earlier. And from here, the NSX manager itself, again, is, it runs as a virtual machine, and it provides a lot of that management interface uh, into the rest of the components. Also, it has this ability to integrate with third-party um, management tools. So a good example is, say, Palo Alto Networks is also doing a session here. As we add security, I'll talk about distributed firewalling in a little bit, but we're a platform, right? NSX is a platform. Uh, we can't do every, everything to everybody, right? There's certain vendors out there that do things a lot better than what we could ever want to do. So we want to be, make sure that we're providing that platform and that integration point. So this, this um, NSX manager is also providing that integration point with other third-party uh, tools. And as I mentioned before, uh, all through that single pane of glass of the vCenter uh, with the vCenter plugin. Uh, so you have kind of this complete uh, interaction between your cloud management platforms, uh, vCenter, and your, your third-party um, uh, management tools uh, for some of the partner integration work, all in one place and then the VM form factor. And a couple kind of side notes. If you want to know more about how NSX integrates with kind of some of the higher tools, so, I mean, the, 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 the cloud management platforms, we have a session on both VRA integration deep dive and also OpenStack uh, integration deep dive a little bit later in the week. So let's, let's take a look at how we would deploy and configure this environment. First of all, we have, of course, our NSX managers. The first thing you've got to go configure and deploy. Um, <coughs> the NSX manager, once it's deployed, will then register with vCenter and install that plugin to be able to have that kind of single point management. From there, uh, the NSX manager will then go deploy the NSX controllers. So we'll have that controller cluster, a set of VMs, that, that'll be all set up to, in order to actually start um, the, the, setting up the topologies and the configurations of the virtual networks and um, distributed routing, firewall, all the other functions, but we gotta get that set up first. Um, next, we'll actually start preparing the hosts. So we'll go install those VIBs that I talked about earlier, the logical routing, log the um, logical switching, distributed firewalling, all the user world agents to be able to communicate. So this isn't something you have to do manually. You don't have to go to every single host and go, okay, I've got to install these. It all installs directly um, through this NSX manager. And we'll do that across um, all the different uh, vSphere clusters. Once that's all set up, we start setting up our edge services. So we look at, okay, do we need a, um, <coughs> a physical to virtual interaction? Do we need a um, load balancing? Do we need site-to-site um, -site L2 VPN services, um, et cetera? So we start setting those up. So we have all of our edge services gateways set up. So you have a set of VM. So basically you have the VMs for the NSX manager, the NSX controller VMs, and your VMs for your NSX edge services gateways. So once all those are set up, you're ready to go. So before I move on, I'll take a, a second to talk about how we do things across multiple vCenters. So um, when we look at six, NSX 6.2, uh, we still have a one-to-one -one mapping from an NSX manager to vCenter. But um, we're introducing uh, the concept of a universal cluster of uh, controllers. So you have this universal cluster of controllers in your primary site, and then you'll set up um, your secondary sites uh, with, with um, the configuration. And when you kind of start configuration, the configuration is then synced across. So if, you're, if you've ever seen NSX in action with disaster recovery, for example, um, we did have uh, VRO workflows to be able to do the synchronization for you, but this is all inherently integrated within that system. 
so that this logical network itself is distributed across these vCenters. And this can go up to 150 millisecond round trip time. So this could be another data center that you're doing disaster recovery in, that maybe you have some developer <coughs> uh, VM set up in that disaster recovery site, and your primary VM set up in your primary data center, and it's all one logical network. So when you're moving some of your dev, dev to production, it's seamless, right? You can just do that migration, and you can have that virtual network transfer over into the, um, the primary site. And then if a disaster happens, then you can use SRM to be able to move your, um, your workloads, and your logical networking is all in place. The security policies will still be in place. They're all the same. It's all synchronized across the different vCenters. There's a whole hour session on just how this works. <laughs> so if it, this is one of the areas that if you want a deep dive on just the cross vCenter solution itself, uh, the net 5989 will be covering a full hour uh, discussion on how we do cross, uh, cross vCenter. So we've talked about uh, deployment of the cluster. So uh, we've set up the components, uh, the deployed the NSX manager, deployed the controllers. Um, we've set that the hosts have been prepped. These are all one-time deals, right? So if you're looking at a multi-tenant environment, you're not having to do this every tenant, <laughs> right? This is kind of the one-time setup, and you're good to go. Um, what you're going to be doing once this is set up is actually utilizing it for all your logical networking needs. Uh, configuring those topologies, distributed firewalling, all of these things are probably likely to change constantly as you're spinning up and down new tenants um, and as new security policies are added or removed. So let's move on from the components into the switching. How does the switching work um, and how is it uh, implemented? So one of the problems with the, so the NSX logical switching is trying to solve, right? We had a physical network for a long time that needed to remain at layer two. So new protocols were developed, um, and like Fabric Path or Trill or any kind of name your kind of layer two protocol to be able to kind of create this whole big layer two domain. But with that became a lot of challenges with broadcast and um, we moved into the era of uh, kind of trying to bring layer three now down to the top of rack or down to the um, kind of the furthest endpoint that we can to kind of not only deal with the scalability and the issues with broadcast, but also to limit the, um, the failure domains as well. If you have one big protocol running everything, it, it, there, the failure domains can start to get um, overwhelming. So enter um, logical switching to be able to set up a logical switch, not just within a particular host itself, but across hosts. So this logical switch will allow communication, not just um, from that one host, but say a VM, that web VM may be on several different systems, so we can switch traffic as if it's just switching. It could go across layer three hops within the underlay network. Um, it could go la past layer two hops. It doesn't really even matter. Um, but it's, it's seamless from the VM perspective. So the VM just sees itself directly connected to the other VM, basically. It just sees it as just a hop, just that one little switch away. It's the same exact switch. And that's where the controller kind of comes into play uh, to, for all intents and purposes, fool those VMs into thinking that. So that um, as it's looking for its neighbor, it's going to send an ARP request. And that controller is going to reply as if um, it's the router, basically, or, or it's the, the actual system itself saying, okay, here's your MAC address, send it along the way. So we saw this at the beginning, the logical switching. Um, generally, the most, <coughs> we see the most is um, a logical switch equals, say, a subnet. So you have a set of IP addresses in that subnet range equals the virtual switch, which is basically a bridge domain. Um, it could be a little different, but that's kind of the majority of the deployments that we see out there is these, these logical switches equals kind of a bridge domain of communication between those. But if we look at a physical network, as I discussed before, um, this, this logical 
uh, distributed switch spans across um, all of this infrastructure so that they can create this, uh, communicate seamlessly. So let's take a look at um, how this traffic pattern works uh, from a kind of internal guts uh, of the system. So uh, first of all, we have, let's say, two systems uh, with the VMs that need to communicate via layer two. And so in this, in this step, uh, you have this VXLAN overlay. So VXLAN itself, if you're not familiar with VXLAN, or, is just a, a kind of a header that we tack on to be able to communicate between the two um, through this virtual tunnel endpoint, so VTEP. Uh, the virtual tunnel endpoint is set up with its own port group. The reason for this is that this is kind of your central tunnel for all of the traffic between different hosts. So if you have another logical switch and another VM, we're not going to create another VTEP. It's kind of like you can tunnel all of this traffic. You just put on a different header to be able to kind of go through this tunnel. So you're just saying, okay, well, this header is 5001, this header is 5002, so we kind of will send it along the way, and we know where to go between the different hosts. One VTEP can have multiple different uh, VMs and switches or port groups. So um, we take our layer two packet. We send it over to our VM. So again, this is kind of obfuscating the step of where it needs to go look up how to, the uh, MAC address of that, of that VM. So if it doesn't know the MAC address of where to send that VM, it just has an IP address, it'll ARP for that IP address. And as it sends that ARP request, that ARP request will first be intercepted by the VTEP. So the VTEP itself will get that ARP request and say, okay, maybe I know it. So I have it in my cache. I've communicated to it before, maybe another VM has communicated to it, all is replied. So it never even goes to the controller. It'll just stop at that point. Um, but if the VTEP doesn't have that IP address and that or that MAC address mapped to that IP address, then it'll send it to the controller. And the controller kind of has that central view of everything. So it's going to reply back with the MAC address of that uh, VM uh, that's paired to that IP address. So then it'll send it uh, across the, encapsulate it now, um, send it across the wire to the other um, VTEP, where it'll be de-encapsulated and sent to the other VM itself. So this is the point where um, the, the networking layer itself doesn't matter, right? We care about it because as we send this traffic across, we're adding another tag to it, right? So the underlying network now doesn't really know what's going on. Um, it's a good thing from a agility standpoint but if, you, if you're a networking person or talk to your networking team, they're like, whoa, whoa, you're hiding stuff from me. <laughs> Don't do that. How am I going to troubleshoot it? How am I going to debug it? It becomes an issue. So we have um, a lot of new interesting tools um, within 6.2 that'll help with that behavior um, to be able to actually look in and provide more information about the physical and virtual um, together. I think... <coughs> With a, lot of new manage with a lot of new technology out there, the management tools kind of start to lag behind the actual implementation of the products. So now I think we're, we're at the point where um, we're catching up. So if we look at vRealize operations, there's a whole session on NSX with vRealize operations um, later in the week that'll go through how that integration is happening. I mean, actually see from a single pane of glass troubleshooting from the, the VM traffic itself going all the way down into the physical and see packet loss in a physical switch for that particular VM. So that's all available today, and it's something that we've put a lot of effort and a lot of uh, time into um, talking with the different networking teams to make sure that we have a compelling solution to be able to provide that operational functionality. So we need to encapsulate the packet, and it heads to uh, the VM. So one of the, one of the features in 6.2 is trace path. Uh, where we can actually, it'll show all of these things happening hop by hop by hop um, uh, through, the, uh, through this infrastructure. Um, I'll touch on this just briefly. Um, I talked about the different modes of, or I talked about the, no, the need for not doing multicast. Um, some networking teams will say, oh, well, I'm already running multicast. I know it really well. I want to use multicast. Great. 
got that option, <laughs> right? So we want to make sure we provide the keys to um, be able to do this in any fashion uh, that, that, that you want. But in general, most of this is, is done directly within this kind of unicast mode. So let's move on um, to routing and take a look at uh, when we add routing into the mix. So as we add routing into the mix, um, I'll build this slide, there's a couple different mechanisms of routing uh, that I talked about. So we have a distributed routing really for that east-west communication. So from uh, VM to VM is going to be using this distributed logical router um, to communicate with each other. On the right, we have our NSX Edge. So this is with our um, <coughs> Edge Services Gateway to provide that kind of north-south. So we call it north-south traffic, but it could be east-west traffic too if it's just a database talking to another database over layer three. Right? This is when we're talking about layer three adjacencies. So anytime two things are on two different subnets, that's when we're talking about routing uh, functionality. And uh, as I mentioned before, there's a logical routing deep dive that goes into a tremendous amount of detail on how this works in um, uh, different scenarios. Um, but we'll, we'll go through a couple examples now so you have a good understanding of uh, a foundation uh, to build upon for, for the logical routing. So let's take a look at... Um, the, the logical routing itself, right? First, we have the idea that we can do multiple tenants, right? So we can just set up this distributed logical routing in different topologies depending on the tenant, right? We're not setting this up um, just once and every tenant has to use kind of the same logic, this same routing instance. That would kind of defeat the whole purpose of network virtualization itself. So we want to make sure that each tenant, as we go deploy, maybe the tenant's like, um, dev app or, or dev production test, or it could be um, uh, different tenants within an organization, or it could be actual service kind of uh, uh, orchestration. Um, but each of them can have its own kind of distributed logical routing um, configured within uh, those, those topologies. So it's something that's scalable and distributed. Um, so moving on from there. Um, okay. So what are some of the challenges that we were trying to solve when we we're developing distributed logical routing? So if you're from a networking background, you'd understand that, um, I mean, you probably even understand it too from any other background, is that it's really difficult to have to kind of span between groups to be able to set up um, different routing domains, right? You, ha you can do it, right? There's virtual uh, routing and forwarding instances within the physical hardware itself, but it becomes yet another kind of setup that you have to go do, and then you still have that idea of hairpinning, right? You have to come back up to that router, and you gotta come back down. So th those are kind of some of the challenges that um, we're trying to address with this distributed logical router. We wanna move it into software, we wanna move it into the hosts so that we can control it and, and make it really extremely flexible uh, when we do that. And it's actually done in a really elegant way too. We're not trying to um, rewrite history in terms of how routing was done. Right? We support the same routing protocols, OSPF, BGP, ISIS, uh, that the network uh, has um, always been using or has been using for uh, quite some time. Any other question? Sure, so the question is what, what are the differences in use case of logical routing and logical switching? So uh, from kind of like uh, its core is that do I need to, is, is my app on the same subnet? So say I have uh, 172.10.10.1 and 172.10.10.2. They're all in kind of like this same subnet so it can just switch. Like you're not trying to look up a different IP address or send it to, uh, to route to it. But if it's on a completely different IP address range, I gotta route to it, right? It's, it's kind of like between a web and a database tier. I'm probably gonna route between them. I'm, not, I'm probably not gonna create, a, create one big broadcast domain between my web and app tier that um, even though you can, and you can segment it with micro-segmentation, um, but generally you'll create these separate broadcast domains of web, app, database, and then route between them. So the, the logical switching in that same tier, logical routing between the tiers. So uh, um, as we set this up, um, same protocols and same functionality, right? We have our uh, control VM 
that'll be your kind of like supervisor modules or your routing um, engines uh, for your routing protocols, and then you have your data plane uh, to be able to forward. So uh, just uh, to kind of follow up on your question is, this is our logical switching, right? So we have these logical switches that traffic is just switching between. So traffic's flowing between these different tiers, but they can't talk to each other because they're on different subnets. So what we do is add this distributed logical router uh, in between to be able to facilitate that communication. And this distributed logical router itself has a different set of, has its own IP addresses because it's a gateway, right? Um, if you've uh, seen some of the challenges within traditional networking of setting up um, gateway redundancy, so it's like VRP or HSRP or trying to do an anycast gateway um, across everywhere, that, that problem is kind of solved within distributed logical routing because we have these lifts, what we call logical interfaces. We have exter internal lifts and external lifts, or uplink lifts. So our internal lifts are that 172.16.10.1 and 172.16.20.1. Different subnets, that's the gateway to get out, right, for your VMs. Your VMs know about the gateway. Um, it's, it's just one default route, right? It's everything not in my subnet domain that I'm not going to switch, I'm sending to that gateway logical interface, that internal lift. So if you go to the hands-on labs, you'll kind of hear this terminology, internal lift, uplink lift, or if you do the configurations of the NSX, so you'll kind of see those two terminologies. And that's either just the internal, the gateway to the, um, for the VMs, or the uplink lift, which is kind of my way out. So what's peering with a edge gateway or a, or a physical router itself going kind of north uh, of this, or to the right in this picture of this system. So if we look at it as a physical view, again, the same thing holds true in logic, distributed logical routing as it does in the, in the switching world. So this is distributed across um, this infrastructure. So this is logical switching, and then we kind of overlay on our logical routing. And our controllers are really that path um, to provide this information. So um, I'll walk you through a, a packet walk in a second of how this works. But if we look at the components, one component I have not mentioned yet is this, this, um, this uh, controller VM. So the DLR controller VM, distributed logical routing, DLR control VM. So this VM is, in, is installed in a high availability pair, so active standby for the logical routing. Think of this as what I mentioned before, like the supervisor engine, the routing engine. This is what will actually peer and handle the, the protocol. So um, NSX manager will set up the, the logical routing instances and uh, set up how we do the control uh, cluster communication. The control cluster will be the, still the single point that communicates down, uh, south to the, the ESXi house. So even though this logical routing VM is doing kind of the peering, we still have that single kind of channel for topology and information dissemination into um, the, the actual hosts themselves. So as I mentioned before, this DLR will actually do the peering to your exit, right? So the, that kind of north-south control, v, or the uh, edge services gateway, or a physical um, router itself, it'll peer with. It'll kind of figure out, pull that routes down, whether it's OSPF, BGP, ISIS, it'll pull all the external routing information down. And then it'll talk to the controller about that information, that state that it learned. So it learned, oh, I know about this route and this route to get that are external and it'll push that information down into the, the physical uh, uh, DLRs within the NSX, or within the hypervisor uh, and running within the kernel of the systems. So that now uh, what we've done here is the DLR inherently knows how to get to the other VMs uh, of the other tiers, right? Because it got that information from the controller and it can build that topology. And now it knows about the external world, too, um, that's out, outside of the virtual, um, to be able to communicate outside of the virtual. So those are kind of the two steps. Is internally, I know about it because I just have a gateway, right? It's my log internal logical interfaces that I send traffic to. And then it, that, that DLR then knows about the external. So the DLR can then send traffic externally as well, outside of that domain. 
And then the data path is just the same data path that was before. So we're not sending things through the DLR control VM. It's just control. It's just distributing state. So that's why we're able to scale and in a distributed fashion. And that's why we're able to be um, pretty close to line rate in terms of traffic, because we're doing it all internal. It's in that, it's in that data path anyway that we're sending packets through. So distributed east-west um, routing traffic flow. Let's take a look at an example of how this works um, in action. So here we have two VMs on different hosts. Let's say one of the, of, on the, the VM1 is a web tier, VM2 is uh, um, an app tier. So they need to send traffic uh, to each other. Um, so first of all, we have this um, lift one and lift two, right, for the different VXLAN segments that I'm com I can communicate across. So these are the internal gateways that the um, VMs can use. So first, I'm going to send this packet to, um, <coughs> to the VMAC. So I haven't mentioned the VMAC before, but the VMAC is the MAC address of the logical interface on the DLR itself within that host. So we have that DLR in, in the, the vSphere host um, that's connected, and say lift one is, has that, that destination MAC. So and since it's my gateway, I'm always gonna put that VMAC on it. And that VMAC is actually the same VMAC across everywhere, because it doesn't go anywhere past that point. So it's the same VMAC on every single uh, host out there because it's, it's, it's just local right there. It stops right there. It's gonna be replaced uh, in the future once we get to the DLR. So as we move through this, uh, we'll send the packet to the DLR since that's the gateway. So the DLR will then replace the destination MAC address with the actual destination MAC address. So you may ask, how does it know that destination MAC address? Well, if you think about it, it's actually directly connected. It's not something that is remote, even though that it looks remote, it's on a different host, but a distributed logical router is, is distributed across every host that has a, the VM that it's involved in, or the, that, that tier that it's involved in. So it knows the MAC address, because it's already learned it because it's been sent from that VM at a different time. So it just knows that, that the MAC address is directly connected. It just sees it as, okay, that, that virtual tunnel endpoint is my destination. Here's my MAC address. Let's put it on. I'm going to send it out. So we go ahead and put on our great encapsulation, send it through our, our, our tunnel um, to the destination VM. And it encapsulates it, and we're, we're set to go. So it doesn't touch the, the, really the DLR on the other side. It just sends out through the VTEP that tunnel, the transport end to uh, the other side. Um, how this differs in different scenarios uh, is say you have, say these two VMs are on the same host. For example, we'll use our hairpinning example where if the two VMs were on the same host before, we had to kind of go out to the physical router and kind of loop back in. This, this scenario is exactly the same. Nothing changes except for not sending it out the tunnel. It's still a directly connected interface. It just sends it directly to the host. It doesn't have to exit the system itself. So the only thing that changes is just I'm not going to send it out VXLAN across the network in the VXLAN encapsulation. I'm just going to send it directly back to itself uh, or to the VM on the same host. And how this differs in a case I want to get the, the, the virtual or the physical world from the virtual, right? So instead of sending it across this kind of VXLAN over to another VM, same thing, I just send it across over to the Edge Services Gateway to be able to send a traffic out to the external world. So it's, it's, it's once you kind of learn one scenario and get the fact that like distributed logical router generally already knows the MAC addresses of where it is and where it needs to go because they're kind of directly connected. It's like oh, that, that host is directly connected to my router, it's just that router, happen, that router port happens to be somewhere else. Um, or it's a gateway for the uh, external traffic. So let's look at some of the, uh, uh, briefly a topology of, uh, of uh, uh, in the enterprise of what this would look like. So first of all, 
um, to recap, <coughs> we have our DLR, which is kind of just handling the internal kind of traffic, right? Le east, west, it never goes up to an external gateway. So east, west traffic is a kind of handle that is distributed logical router. We're routing traffic kind of through this network um, using VXLAN in case we need to go to a different host. Oops. And then when we want to go north south, that DLR is just kind of running a routing protocol between the DLR and your edge services gateway uh, to be able to understand how do I need to get out. So that north south traffic takes place kind of that way. Um, but what we do with the, the edge services gateway is to make sure the scales, right? Say I have a lot of north south traffic or a lot of physical workloads. Um, that uh, exist in my network that I need to communicate to. We can actually scale this out up to eight um, uh, gateways, so 80 gigs worth of throughput um, in order to get out. And what we do is we just peer basically from the DLRs up to the edge gateways and the edge gateways up to the kind of the physical um, exit routers themselves. So complete routing topology, um, this isn't something, I mean, doing it in software in a distributed fashion is new, but the same kind of, comp um, the same uh, mechanisms and uh, properties apply to here as it, it just the physical routers themselves. We want to create a really highly scalable data plane, and we want to have a really resilient, redundant um, control plane that isn't involved with direct data plane communication. So traffic can then flow using equal cost multipathing. So equal cost multipathing is just I have eight gateways. <coughs> They're all equal. So I can send my packet eight ways out. So low bouncing and redundancy is all taken care of um, right off the bat. So what have we seen so far? We've seen how the NSX is architectured, some of the components of how it's built, the NSX manager, the controllers, um, what we need to push down onto the hosts, and we've seen some of the switching and routing and how, how it's all connected. So let's move on into the distributed firewalling and micro-segmentation. Distributed firewalling, right? I'm not gonna spend a ton of time discussing the challenges and benefits, I know I'm running short on time here, but the idea is I wanna create this distributed architecture for firewalling. Uh, layer two through layer four, uh, layer four firewalling capability and that segmentation. So there's micro-segmentation uh, and isolation, so we can isolate the tiers and distributed firewalling uh, to add that in, and then services on top of that. So as I mentioned before, NSX is a platform. We want to do firewalling um, to a, a certain point, but at some certain point, we, we need some layer five through layer seven firewalling, say maybe an IPS, IDS, some advanced firewalling technology. We can actually integrate that, and I'll show you how that works. Uh, but there is a full hour deep dive just on firewalling itself. So later in the week, there's that full deep dive on NSX distributed firewalling um, going over a lot more detail than I can do uh, here in this session. So distributed, distributed firewalling um, and the key features and capabilities. So distributed firewalling takes place actually before we do anything else in NSX or in, in the VMs. So this happens before we hit the vSwitch before we do encapsulation, before we do lookups, before we do any of this information, we hit the firewall. So it's independent of whether you use VLANs, VXLANs, what you're doing, it, it, it happens instantaneously, right? That's the first thing it's gonna hit is, as it comes out that VM, is gonna hit that distributed firewalling service. And it's gonna do some lookups and matches based off of what your policy is. <clears throat> From there, once it's permitted, say I do permit that traffic flow, to take place, it's going to instantiate an entry in a flow table. So you're gonna keep track of all these flows, and that's how you really do that layer two through layer four uh, firewalling, this TCP um, or spoof guard or all of these types of things, you gotta keep track of flows. So if that flow is permitted, then it's gonna be installed in the flow table, and, that, and it's gonna be, be, be kept track of as long as that flow's alive, so in order to do that firewalling capabilities in that device. And that's all happening before I even encrypt a packet and do anything else. Um, from there, I'm gonna do some partner services, but I'll get to that in a second. 
So what does the rules look like when actually you need to go configure a distributed firewalling? And this is something that I get, um, as I talk with some of the security teams, I start getting some kind of head nods of this is, this is really useful, um, is that I'm able to actually create rules that aren't IP addresses or MAC addresses or port numbers or uh, those types of things. First off, I can actually create rules based off VM names, right? VM one, the, this, this web VM talking to another web VM. So as soon as web VMs are added, they'll inherit these policies that can take place and you can create a really great infrastructure that also moves with that VM, is spun up and down with that VM, and is destroyed with that VM. So there's this idea of security sprawl that's happening. Um, not really security sprawl, but like the um, explosion of the security tables. So the security tables in a given infrastructure um, especially in a virtualized environment, tend to grow and grow and grow and grow and never kind of shrink. Because as new VMs are added, the security policy says, okay, that VM is equal to this IP address. I gotta go map this IP address and actually start building out this topology. And then maybe I have this IP address with its port numbers for TCP or UDP or web traffic or HTTP, et cetera, et cetera. So it starts to kind of ballooning out of control. And once it gets to a point a certain point, they're just like, I don't want to touch it. If the VM is destroyed, whatever, just leave that entry in there until someone, until it breaks something, basically. So um, we can do VM names, we can do by tiers, right? We can do one, v one tier to another, so the vSwitch, right? So we can do web tier to app tier, we can do all of these different uh, firewalling rules based off of these uh, <coughs> different attributes. So let's take an example of building a uh, web DMZ. So we have our web tier and app tier and our distributed firewallings put in place. So first of all, we want to stop web tiers from talking to each other. So we don't want, so say a web, one web VM is infected. We don't want it to infect any other web VMs. So let's just stop it right there. So it doesn't matter if it's in the same tier, we can, since it's, it's independent of whatever virtual networking we're doing, it, we can just say, okay, no, that web VM is never going to talk to another web VM because I know that they don't need to and they can only talk out externally. So any web tier, so any source can talk to the web tier through HTTPS. So we can allow that communication in, saying, okay, any HTTPS traffic we're allowing in, and then any traffic to the web tier block. So uh, basically, anything but HTTPS, block, coming in. So now we've kind of locked things down to kind of a, 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 a very granular level to be able to say um, anything coming, web tier can't talk to web tier, only thing that comes in is HTTPS. So if an if attacker comes in with HTTPS and tries to do anything else, it, it's completely blocked. And from there, we can have, let's say, um, web tier can talk to app tier over TC, a certain TCP port. So the web tier can service the app tier through, uh, say, this TCP port alone so that they can communicate with each other. And then finally, anything else from that, that web tier to the app tier block. So now we know the exact communication patterns we expect, and that's the only thing we, we're going to see. So partner services, how do we integrate that? So as I talked about before, we have the uh, distributed firewalling happens before we even hit the virtual switch itself. So we have this idea of slices. So we can kind of move around slices depending on what order we want to execute things. But generally you're going to have distributed firewalling hit first. You're going to do distributing firewalling function. And then you're going to move along the, the row to other slices. And the next slice may be a policy that redirects some of the traffic to a partner solution, say a Palo Alto VM. So instead of having this virtual firewall um, somewhere else, we can have that virtual firewall directly on the same host and redirect traffic to that virtual firewall um, that's doing, say, layer five through seven, and then back out and, and down. So we can kind of do that redirection even before it hits that, um, that virtual switch to be able to actually lock things down um, and integrate with different partner solutions in a really elegant way. So moving on to services, I know I have one minute here, which is great because I don't have a ton on services. <laughs> There's a lot of great services um, out there um, that, are, that we have sessions on, but we have 
I mean, firewalling, NAT, um, DHCP, routing, um, load balancing, site-to-site -site VPN, SSL VPN, L2 VPN, and of course, high availability. So all of these on our Ed Services gateways, we have a lot of great services out there. I'll talk about two of them now, just to kind of wrap things up. Um, oh yeah, DNS and Syslog, of course. So integrating services, uh, I'll skip this slide for the sake of time. Um, we have a lot of benefits of doing it. So load balancing, right? So one thing I want to mention about load balancing before I leave is on load balancing, uh, we can do, um, we have a technology preview in this session. So if you go to the NSX load balancing deep dive session, you'll see a technology preview of how we're doing distributed load balancing. So instead of load balancing just in one spot, we can distribute it um, in kernel just as, as we're doing load balancing or as we're doing distributed routing and other uh, distributed functions. Um, next example, um, L2 VPN. So there is another session. It's not called L2 VPN session. It's called connecting to remote sites. So this is an idea of, we can do this with cross VC, right? As I talked about before, we can connect remote sites, but there's some need of whether you're looking at encryption or some other uh, functions, but longer distances, right? If you want to do long distances, if you can't run VXLAN across that WAN, um, even though it's just an IP address, because VXLAN requires an extra little bit of packets, uh, an extra little bit of header on the packet, which may extend it past 1500 bytes. So there's certain scenarios where that edge device cannot handle greater than 1500 bytes. So L2 VPN is just another way to connect those two sites together. So um, this is another example of uh, the types of services that we have. So um, to finish up, uh, we've talked about the services, uh, central APIs, an extensive third-party ecosystem that we have available. And with that, I mean, we have a lot of different uh, technology partners out there uh, that are actually integrating within our ecosystem whether they're NSX aware, such as like your um, logging and syslogs and NetFlow and all of these representations, or there's actually service integration um, and insertion, such as like Trend or um, Palo Alto Networks F5, all of these other areas that add just even more benefit onto the platform that we have available today. And with that, um, there's a lot of great resources out there. I mentioned a bunch of different sessions. Um, Communities.vmware.com, we actually post even more information to than VMware.com because of the kind of some of the, the strict guidance of VMware.com. So check out communities.vmware.com. There's a lot of great reference architecture decks and design guides and so on that, that will eventually make themselves to the VMware.com, but generally get posted there first. So always remember to go, to, go there, check out some of the details. And with that, um, thank you very much.